Good day, everyone. So for today's lesson, we will talk about the foundations of human rights. Specifically, we will define and understand the concept of human rights. Let's try to be familiar with the historical overview of human rights. We will have to appreciate the principles of human rights and be familiar with the documents on human rights, both at the international level and at the national or the municipal level. So first, let's try to understand human rights. So we'll try to understand this concept um, using a layman's perspective. So we can talk about human rights in two ways. First, in a positive sense or in a negative sense. So remember that there are things or certain things that should be done to others. So we call this the positive sense. And there are things that should never be done to others. So we call this the negative sense, okay? So by just looking at these two concepts, we now have a layman understanding of human rights. Okay, so remember these two concepts. Now, we can also look at human rights um, by looking into entitlements, the concept of entitlements and responsibilities. Let's talk about entitlements first. So if you are entitled to a certain thing, say, I am entitled to marry and have a family or freedom of speech. Remember that these are the things that I am entitled to be done to me. And there are also things that I am entitled to have in which people should refrain from doing unto me. Like for example, the freedom from being forcibly evicted from my house. So people should not, especially the government, should not forcibly evict me from my house. However, it goes without saying that we need to act responsibly as individuals and groups to respect the rights of others. So individuals also have responsibilities in using these rights. So remember that in using or claiming these rights, we must respect the rights of others. In the same manner, the government or the state has obligations to perform in order for the people to reach their full potential. Like for example, the provision of healthcare services, the provision of educational services. So in claiming our human rights, remember that we are making a moral claim, normally on our own government, that the government cannot do this and the government cannot just do that because it is a violation of our moral sphere and personal dignity. So remember that no one, not any individual, no government or state can ever take that away. No one can take your human rights away. So always remember that we possess this right simply in virtue of the fact that we are human beings. So absolutely everyone has this right. So there, without being too technical, this is how we can better understand the concept of human rights. Now, there are disagreements in public discourse as to what human rights really are. So there was this um, announcement or this, this speech uh, issued by President Duterte when he talked about um, human rights or the, the, his concern is human rights, not human lives. As if he is saying that these concepts are mutually exclusive. So in one of his speeches, he said that his concern is human lives and not human rights. So can we discuss human rights separately from human lives? So let's try to take a look at these concepts. Right to life. So when we talk about human right, we talk about the right to life. So more than the right to live, or right to life is more than the right to live. Right to live in a manner that benefits our common dignity and enables us to bring our talents to full potential. So remember this concept. This concept is subsumed in the concept of human rights. Human dignity, another concept that we have to understand in understanding the concept of human rights is the concept of human dignity. Human dignity is the belief that all people hold a special value that's tied solely to their humanity, which means that it has nothing to do with class, race, gender, abilities, religion, and any other factor other than being human. So in the past, a gay or a lesbian has been viewed by the society as a deviant behavior. So when we talk about deviant behavior, these are behavior that are not acceptable in a certain society because it goes beyond the norm. 
But now, that concept has changed. Now, if you are part of the LGBTQIA community, you are still considered to be a person with dignity. Because when we talk about human rights, you have a right to be who you are and who you want to be. Now, let's take a look at these photos. Dignity encompasses many things, including the right to fulfill basic needs like food, shelter, and personal safety. So look at the photos shown. There is food, there is shelter, education, health, and even protection. Now, if you take all of these components, or even just one of these components away, human dignity will be violated. So remember, the approach in human rights is holistic, meaning to say, human rights issues, con human rights issues concerns the whole of a person, body, mind, and soul, and all dimensions of life, including intellectual, emotional, social, physical, and so on, from cradle to grave. That is why, when we talk about the right to work, we don't just mean having a job. It means having a decent job, a job that is acceptable, a job that, is, uh, that says something about equity, security, and even human dignity. And when we talk about education, we talk about inclusive and equitable quality education that promotes lifelong learning or lifelong learning opportunities for all. Now, what is the relationship then between human rights and human dignity? Can we look at human rights without taking into consideration human dignity? Again, remember that we can never separate human rights from human life. Why? because human rights arises from human dignity. Human dignity, or human dignity is the very foundation of your human rights. Human dignity is the source of our rights to recognition everywhere as a person. And we can never fully realize our lives without our rights as human. So, the point of human rights is to ensure that human dignity is realized. Now, we can also talk about human rights and human dignity as normative concepts. So when we talk about normative concepts, it's different from, say, this descriptive concept. Because when you uh, pertain to descriptive concept, these are concepts uh, used to describe the world as it is. But when we talk about human rights and human dignity, these are normative concepts, so meaning to say what we should have to consider or we should consider what should we do to secure human rights and human dignity. Now, I remember the problem with some of our leaders in their aggressive um, approach to protect national security, they somehow forget to take into account human rights. Like for example, the war on drugs. So these leaders would then argue that human rights is a Western imposition, hence alien to Filipino culture. Well, these leaders tend to forget that human rights is hinged on human dignity, and human dignity, remember, is a belief that is common to all peoples or cultures all over the world, whether Eastern and Western. So this points to the fact that human rights is universal. Okay, now, uh, when we talk about concepts related to human rights, we also need to differentiate respect from dignity. Okay, so when we talk about respect, respect is showing admiration for someone because of their abilities, qualities, or achievement. But when we talk about dignity, dignity means all people should have the right to be recognized for their inherent humanity and should be treated ethically. So at the second that you were born into this world, the presumption is that you already had human dignity. Okay. Now, having understood all these concepts, having clarified all these concepts, let's talk about how human rights is defined. All right. So human rights are the rights that we have simply because we exist as human beings. So they are not granted to us by anyone, not even by the state. So to have human rights, there is no other requirement other than being human. So these rights are inherent to all 
regardless of color, gender, religion, nationality, ethnicity, political belief, and even language. So these human rights range from the most fundamental, like for example, right to life, to those that make life worth living, like right to security, to own a home or a house, right to food, education, health, and even water. So when we talk about human rights, remember this, that these rights are inherent in our nature and without which we cannot live as human beings. This is the concept of human rights. Now, one way of understanding human rights is by looking at these three broad categories. So, number one, the first generation of civil and political rights. Remember this. Second is the second generation of economic, social, and cultural rights. And the third generation are the so-called solidarity rights. Now let's focus on civil and political rights. So civil and political rights, of course, are among the best known human rights. I'm sure that you are all familiar with civil and political rights. This covers the right to liberty and security of persons, the right against torture, the right to life, equal protection against discrimination, all forms of discrimination, right against arbitrary arrest or detention, right to privacy, freedom of speech, and so on. So these rights gradually evolve over centuries during the long development of democratic society, which serves as the protection of individuals or individuals from the arbitrary exercise of governmental power. So this classification of human rights protect individual, individual's freedom. So this protects your individual freedom from infringement by the governments and even by private individuals, and which ensures your own ability to participate in the civil and political life of your country or state without discrimination or oppression. So these are the so-called civil and political rights. Now, let's try to focus on economic, social, and cultural rights. The second generation of rights started to be recognized when people realized that possession of the first generation of rights, the civil and political rights, would be valueless without the enjoyment of economic, social, and cultural rights. I'm sure that you would have to agree with me on this. The experience of third world countries in their struggle against colonialism the influence of socialism, the experience of people during the First and the Second World War, this all contributed to the development and appreciation of economic, social, and cultural rights. So example of economic and social rights are, number one, the right to work. And remember, when we talk about the right to work, we talk about having a decent job. Okay? The right to an adequate standard of living, including food, clothing, and housing, the right to physical and mental health, especially in this pandemic, the right to a healthy environment, and the right to education. So these are your economic, social, and cultural rights. Now let's proceed and discuss the so-called solidarity rights. The third generation of rights is intended to benefit individuals, groups, and peoples, and its realization will need global cooperation based on international solidarity. So the right to self-determination is the most famous of this right. So in the past, the right to self-determination has been limited to nations, but now it includes even smaller communities like indigenous peoples. Solidarity rights are very important in an age where we are confronting a pandemic, global warming, climate change, terrorism, and so on. So solidarity rights are very important when we are confronting transboundary issues. So examples, aside from right to self-determination, are right to peace, right to development, right to environmental rights, right to food, right of women and children, right to humanitarian disaster relief, and even the right to water. Especially when we talk about transboundary water issues just like that in the Mekong River, wherein it was shared, uh, it is shared by countries such as Laos, um, Vietnam, China, and Cambodia. 
All right, so this is one of the issues that um, uh, confronts people when they talk about human rights, especially in Eastern societies like the Philippines. Is human rights really a Western concept? So disagreements as to whether human rights is a Western concept is uh, very much popular, especially in public discourse. But we have to understand that we can find tra traces of these concepts, the concept of human rights all over the world. Like for example, we can find traces of human rights in religions such as Islam, Buddhism, Judaism, Confucianism, and even Hinduism. So human dignity has been developed along the lines of religious, theological, and ethical perspective. Christian and Islam views, for example, make up this perspective at large. We also have um, Gandhi, who, who opposed British imperial rule in India during the 20th century, um, which he took on the religious principle of ahimsa, or which means doing no harm, which is common to Buddhism, Hinduism, and he turned it into a nonviolent tool for mass action. So in Judaism, we also talk about the sacredness of life. And for Buddhism, life is the most precious thing in the world, so it is imperative that we respect it in all forms. So all religions, whether those originating from Eastern or Western countries, affirm our common humanity, that all people have the same needs and desire. So let's talk about the historical overview of human rights. So we start with ancient history. So most of the world's major belief system has been founded during this time. So the Jewish faith, which later on developed into Christianity, Confucianism and Taoism in China, Hinduism and Buddhism in India, and the humanistic philosophy of Athens. So from the earliest times, for example, we also have the Code of Hammurabi, which talk about principles of justice, fairness, and protection. In the third century BC, the idea of that equality of rights applies to all is found in the Greek philosophy of the Stoics. So the Stoics played an important role in the origin of human rights because according to them, humankind have risen. And by virtue of this reason, all are citizens of the universe. So we had the idea of cosmopolitanism. So that the Greeks would also talk about universal justice as seen in the philosophy of Plato. Aristotle would always talk about a life of virtue, which means a dignified life a life where you can be the best version of yourself. Now this is enshrined in the concept of human dignity and would later on extend with the concept of human rights. In the 13th century, the practice that government owes a responsibility to the people already existed in Greek states such as Athens, but thereafter disappeared for many centuries. In Britain, centuries later, the king was forced to sign the Magna Carta in 1215. So this was a very important document with, uh, which limited the right of the king to do as he wished without regard to the law. So this is a world-famous symbol of justice, fairness, and human rights. And remember, in the age of Reformation, Martin Luther even fought for the right to choose one's own religion over the established religion. So in the 18th century, um, this was the period in which American Declaration of Independence and French Declaration of Human Rights and Citizen were adopted, um, which was... Uh, Influenced by the writings of John Locke, of John Locke rather, who would say that the state should not impose a certain religion. And in the 19th century, um, the American Revolution on the Declaration of the Rights of Man, and these are mostly uh, civil and political rights. But just to clarify, the reason why social and economic rights surface is because of the Industrial Revolution. So during this period, they would talk about labor rights, social conditions, and even private property. So decades later on, slavery was abolished in countries such as Russia, the Netherlands, and the United States. And in the 20th century, this was a very important development. Women's suffrage was introduced in New Zealand, later on in the Netherlands and Russia, the United States, and even the United Kingdom. So since 1948, from the universal, or the adoption of the United Nations on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, we are using this convention, this declaration, in uh, monitoring uh, countries or states members' compliance on uh, human rights. So what is the most important factor behind the development of human rights? 
So remember, the most important factor behind the development of human rights is the pursuit of freedom in the sense of emancipation for such groups as citizens, workers, women, and slaves. So this was just a very brief historical overview of human rights. Now, maybe you would ask me, what about solidarity rights? How can we trace the development of solidarity rights? The right to self-determination was put forward by nations during the Age of Enlightenment, especially for colonized nations. So we would see nations invoking their rights to self-determination, even to the point of fascism, which led to the death of millions. So during worlds, World Wars I and II, horrific abuses, not just between men and women, but also with nations against nations. So in the wars that happened among the states or nations in the world, a lot of smaller nations met a lot of problems. Hence, they wanted to end colonialism and imperialism. So these rights, especially the right to self-determination, have been extended to all nations, regardless of size. So that is the brief historical overview on the concept of human rights. Now let's talk about the principles of human rights. So there are four principles when we talk about the principles of human rights. The first is universality, which means that human rights belong to everyone wherever they are because they are human beings endowed with dignity. That's why we refer to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, universal. So all people are equally entitled to human rights. Second, inalienability. So human rights cannot be ta taken away or given away by any humans except in specific situation and in accordance with the due process of the law. So no person can deprive any person these rights and no person can abandon these rights. But again, remember, there is an exemption. So what if you murdered someone and you were imprisoned? Was your right to freedom violated? The answer is no, because that is a punishment that is accorded to you because of the violation you committed against a society and your fellow human being. So your movement has been merely limited. But always remember that this must be done only after due process. So these are the safeguards issued by the government that, so that even um, those who are, uh, that even criminals or those who are facing a charge um, the requirement is that there should be due process of law. So the enjoyment of all human beings is interlinked. So when we talk about indivisibility and interdependence, remember that the enjoyment of all human beings is interconnected, or, or of all human beings, of human rights, is interconnected or interlinked. So um, why are there issues as to whether um, civil and political rights and economic, social, and cultural rights are, is more important than the other. So there can be traced to the events during the Cold War. This can be traced, this conflict rather, can be traced during the Cold War. So the market economies of the West tended to put greater emphasis on civil and political rights. So when we talk about civil and political rights, remember these are the right to fair trial, freedom of religion, freedom of speech. So while the centrally planned economies of the Eastern Bloc highlighted the importance of economic, social, and cultural rights, such as the right to health, education, adequate standards of living, and food. Now this led to the negotiation and adoption of two separate covenants, the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights and the International Convention on Social, Economic, and Cultural Rights. However, this strict separation has since been abandoned and there has been a return to the original architecture of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which highlights that there is no hierarchy in human rights, meaning civil, political, economic, cultural, and social rights have equal status. Now, let's take this as an example. So it is often harder for individuals who cannot read and write to find work, to take part in political activity, or to exercise their freedom of expression. Let's face it. Let's try to put our shoes in the perspectives of, 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 the, of our brothers and sisters below, living below the poverty line. This is reality, especially now in this pandemic. 
if you don't have food or money to buy water, a house to protect you, you cannot even exercise your political, civil and political rights, such as, for example, participation in barangay assemblies, because you need to prioritize these needs. You are trying to make both ends meet. So now you see why our rights are interdependent. And lastly, equal and non-discriminatory. So meaning to say, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. So freedom in discrimination is what guarantees these rights. Like for example, um, the law uh, creating the Anti-Violence Against Women and Children Act in the Philippines, which guarantees non-discrimination and equality in terms of um, uh, equality among, um, among women. Now remember that when we talk about rights or entitlements, remember that there are corresponding responsibilities when we talk about these rights. There are corresponding obligations. So let's start with the obligation of the state. So what is the state's obligation to us to guarantee our human rights? Number one, the government has to respect these rights. The government has to protect these rights. And the government has to fulfill these rights. So let's take a look at some examples. So in the context of work rights, the obligation to respect means that the state must not use forced labor or deny political opponents work opportunities. So the government has to respect that right. So uh, the government has also to protect that right. So the responsibility to protect means that the state must ensure that employers, both in public and in private sector, pay minimum wage. And under its responsibility to fulfill, the state must provide opportunities for the enjoyment of the right to work, like, for example, by offering training to people. That's why we have PESDA. So remember this. In talking about human rights obligations, the state or the government has to respect, protect, and fulfill these rights. Now, individuals also have obligations to fulfill. So as individuals, we are entitled to our human rights, but we should also respect and stand up for others' rights. This is part of our social contract with the state. The state is there to protect these rights, but we also have the obligation to follow the law. Okay, so now we move on to the international human rights legal regime. International human rights legal regime are codified in treaties. So when we talk about treaties, these are the agreements or, cons or, 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 cons or contracts among governments and states, or states rather. So the international human rights regime as we know it evolved within the United Nations. So a fundamental purpose of the United Nations is to promote human rights, and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is the cornerstone document of modern human rights movement. So as stated in the UN Charter, promoting human rights has been a fundamental purpose of the organization since its inception. Now, these are also other treaties and other legally binding documents under the auspices of the UN. So there are more than 20 multilateral human rights treaties, although these are one of the most important ones. So we have the Charter of the United Nations, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Now, take note that the UDHR, or the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, is not a treaty. Okay, but this forms part of the customary international law because this is virtually endorsed by technically all states among the world. All right? So we also have the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, or the SEDAW, which is very important because, uh, because of the SEDAW, we now have this law uh, in the Philippines called the um, Anti-Violence Against Women and Children's Act, which is our compliance to the SEDAW. So this is very important because the SEDAW was the first ever um, international um, document that would define discrimination against women and which has been used by states ever since. We also have the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the Convention on Migrant Workers, and the Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Now, the international and regional human rights treaty system 
may seem focused on the international level, yet clearly it is at the national level that promotion and protection of human rights matters most. That is the reason why we also need to take a look at the national laws and even the constitution that guarantees the human rights. So first off, we focus on Article 2, Section 11 of the Philippine Constitution. So it says here, the state values the dignity of every human person and guarantees full respect for human rights. So it is clear that the Philippines upholds the values, uh, the dignity of every human person and respect human rights. So the Philippines, through its fundamental law, the Constitution, the basic law, made sure that human rights will be protected. We also have Article 3, which is very important. So Article 3, also known as the Bill of Rights, contains 22 sections, which talk about the rights of every citizen. And under Section 1, this is just one sentence, but this sentence is, is very comprehensive, so that even if you remove all the remaining 21 sections in the Bill of Rights, you are still protected. Section 1 of the Article 3 of the Philippine Constitution says that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall any person be denied the equal protection of the law. So there are many um, provisions under this article, but um, since in the interest of time, we'll just focus on its salient points. So these are the other rights or provisions under Article 3 of the Philippine Constitution, which include freedom of religion, freedom of speech, expression, and, and uh, freedom from arbitrary arrest, peaceful assembly, freedom from warrantless arrest, privacy of communication or correspondence, right against torture, violence or threat, due process of law, no person shall be detained solely based on political beliefs, just acquisition of private property, so that the government cannot just take your property away without notice and just compensation, free access to courts and quasi-judicial bodies, and right to be informed of his right to remain silent. So the context of this constitution was actually the aftermath of the martial law. That's why it's very reactive. That's why in this constitution, the 1987 Philippine Constitution, the notion of human rights has been emphasized in this fundamental law, so-called fundamental law. Now, these are the other salient points. In the 1987 Philippine Constitution, that would talk about human rights or that would guarantee human rights. So number one, the constitution declares the principles in, on human rights and protection of vulnerable groups. It expands the guarantees on human rights and fundamental freedoms. It also incorporates social justice provisions. It directs all learning institutions to foster respect for human rights, to teach the rights and duties of citizenship, requires all security forces to respect and protect human rights as they perform their missions and operation, and even mandates the establishment of the Commission on Human Rights as, independent, as an independent national human rights institution tasked to undertake services and programs for the protection and promotion of human rights in this country. So there are basically a lot of provisions in the 1987 Philippine Constitution that would cover, that would guarantee human rights, but these are the most important ones. So if we discuss all those provisions, we will not be finished in the, uh, we will not be finished in, in a day. So I just highlighted the, the salient provisions. Okay. Now aside from the 1987 Philippine Constitution, we also have legislations. So as, as an example, we have the Anti-Violence Against Women and Children Act, or RA 9262, an uh, act uh, that, would be, that would protect our environment, the Clean Water Act of 2004, Clean Air Act, the Toxic Substances, Hazardous and Nuclear Waste Control Act of 1990. We also have the Labor Code of the Philippines, the Magna Carta of Women, Magna Carta of, in of Disabled Persons, Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act of 1997. So we basically have a lot of legislations protecting human rights. And we, we can say somehow that uh, we are indeed um, uh, advancing in terms of the protection of human rights in our country but we have to understand that our system is not perfect. That is the reason why we had issues like the war on drugs, which uh, last year, the United Nations Security Council issued a resolution, a memorandum against uh, the, the Philippines' drug and war. We also have the struggle of the Lumad tribes in Mindanao. We also have problems on, uh, uh, on, on the freedom of speech by, uh, as an example, 
uh, some of the media are, are being um, killed in the process. And then we also have um, environmental activists um, and their lives are endangered. So there are a lot of problems, but basically uh, it, is, it, it is good to, to somehow say that um, we are doing a lot of, um, or we, ha we have a lot of laws that, that are somehow protecting this uh, human rights. Aside from the Philippine constitutions, we, constitution, we also have these legislations. Okay. So let me end this presentation um, by sharing with you the statement by the former South African president and, and civil rights advocate Nelson Mandela, who dedicated his life to fighting for equality. So remember this when we talked about human rights. To deny people their human rights is to challenge their very humanity. So human rights are the very essence of man. They are what makes us human. What makes us human. So deny them and you deny man's humanity. With this, always remember that no cause is more worthy than the cause of human rights. So that ends my uh, presentation. Thank you very much for listening.